And a question I guess I have for you that I want to start us off with is this. Why in the world are we supposed to sound the shofar? What is the reason the shofar sounds in Rosh Hashanah? I mean, as we have talked a little bit earlier, already I mentioned, Rosh Hashanah does not have a lot of commandments. There are all kinds of commandments for different holidays. And yes, we're supposed to bring an offering and sacrifice and have a sacred assembly or things like that. But the main idea is to have the sound of the shofar and to hear that particular noise. And there seems to be a reason behind it. There seems to be a, a purpose behind it. And so I want to hear what you guys think. The Mashiach will come at the sound of the shofar. I like that. So that's a good reason for us to sound the shofar because we certainly do want Mashiach to come, right? right. Unless some of you are not ready. <laughs> then, then, you're, then you kind of sit quietly and say, no, 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 not yet, yet, not yet, <laughs> not ready. There is a tradition that Mashiach will sound a particular shofar when he comes. One of the horns of the ram on on the Adibat Yitzchak. Um, okay. The other one was that. The, the other one. one. Yeah. Okay. So so Akidat Yitzchak is the greater one. That's that's a beautiful tradition. Yes, David. I'm gonna go with Al's answer. He said it's to wake people up after a long service. To wake people up after a long service. Al, is, was that your answer? Yeah. Very wise, very wise answer. Yes, indeed, is to wake people up after a long service. If people have part time staying up, that that would definitely do it for you. So as a former trumpet player with the Youth Symphony, I could say it's probably the most piercing instrument. And so okay. that's why in ancient warfare, for example, they would communicate, in some cases, with the trumpet. Okay. Because it sounds over a long distance. So it does. So it's sort of the lead instrument. Lead instrument. It carries for a long way. So particularly... As I'm, th as I'm thinking about all these things, and you guys are bringing up some really good traditions, uh, and there's probably a few more that we can think about. I heard the shofar sounds um, confuses uh, Hasatan, the accuser, after the pros prosecutors all right. all, uh, over, you know, over sins. Right. So, uh, uh, so, yeah. Good. So if we're standing before Hashem in his heavenly court, and the accusations of our sins are, are, are sounding, and all of a sudden they're... The, the alarm goes off, right? The proceedings kind of get really into confusion, right? <laughs> that's the idea. So the, to confuse the accuser. That's a good tradition as well. I heard that. That's good. Anybody else has a, has a new one for me? Okay. You got one? Oh, it's the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. So we, we, we are looking for that day. We're looking for that moment as well. And so signing a shofar... You guys, you know, that, that's certainly connected with that. So, and we're going to talk about some of these things today. But um, let's see. I want to ask you. So everyone familiar with the shofar, right? So here's a simple question. Uh, which one of these you should blow? Just tell me. Right side, left side? Left side. Left side. So, so, so this one is okay to blow. And this one, not okay? Because it's a Viking point. Now, not you, okay. So Dave is giving me an answer. That's his own answer. Okay, good. Al is like, I did not say that. <laughs> okay. It's a cow horn. It is a cow horn. You got it. So we have a shofar, which is a ram's horn. And then we have a cow horn. Now, what, what makes shofar a shofar? In order to have a shofar, what do you need to have? Well, that's, that's in order to blow a shofar. You have to have lips. In order to have a shofar. Some people have it just sitting on their shelf looking pretty. Okay? So to have, to have one, to have a, a kosher shofar, what do you have to have? A curve. A curve? Okay. Not, I I'm not sure that's necessary, but it, that's a good one. It, it certainly does the sound. So it has to come from a kosher animal. A good one. Yeah. So if I blow a horn from non-kosher animal, it would be problematic, right? It wouldn't be a kosher so far. So, of course, cows are kosher, kosher right? But we want to stay away from the cow concept. 
Brad says. Now, why in the world would we not blow a shofar that's out of made out of cow horn? It's a lot of gold. The sound probably oh, Connection to the golden calf. Connection to the golden calf. Very good. We finally got to it. So the reason why we blow this one and not this one is because when we blow the shofar, it is at the moment of repentance, right? And one thing we're not supposed to remind God at the moment of repentance is our worst sin as a people. That's the golden calf. That's exactly why the cow horn is absolutely kosher and beautiful and wonderful and probably would even sound great. But it's not going to be blown because the last thing we want to do is to remind God of the golden calf incident. And so if you're ever surprised why, you know, one you see all the time and the other one you don't, that's really the reason why. Yes, that's not As, golden kudu we worshipped. <laughs> right, right, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't know, because I have been kind of seen yes. more of just the ram's horn. Kudu, ibex, goat, ram, any variety of uh, those hooked animals with hollowed out horns in particular are perfectly fine, yes. Also with the cow horn, you're drinking from the mind, that seems like you were not hearing a sound too well. Yeah, yeah. Texas Longhorn. Think that. That that would be pretty good, right? Yeah. Now, in our English Bibles, it was always referred to as the golden calf, but uh, I've heard that it could have been a, a replica of the apis bull from Egypt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it would bulls. have been a full-grown cow. Male Most cow. likely. Most likely. If they came out of Egypt and that's what they wanted to do, they probably would have gone by default and picked one of the Egyptian deities, which would make sense. The Apis bull would, would have been... They were Egyptians in the crowd. They said, hey, we know exactly what to do. <laughs> I got one somewhere around here. Let me see if I can, we can fashion one. Uh, anyone else over here? Okay. All right. So, uh, that's, really, that's really the reason. That's why you hear the sound of one. It's really not the sound it makes. Uh, it's the association of the shofar. So yes, kudu is perfectly fine. Ibex, you know, oryx, there are all kinds of animals that shofars come from. So uh, a lot of times, well, if you've been here before, you know that I'm known to bring my ibex horn and to blow it. So, uh, and it sounds different. The ibex horn sounds different from kudu. So I think this year, I think I'm going to go for the kudu. It's a little easier. So. So it's I always struggle because it is so so it's it's a straight horn and to get the sound out of it just it takes a lot more long let's put it that way a lot more strength and it doesn't carry as long either but it's a beautiful sound it's a different sound each one of them sounds different and of course the goat horns sounds different and ram's horn sound different because it's the curvature of the horn itself uh, and the nature it's a natural instrument it's a very pure sound so I am always I've always been puzzled why. Why such a simple thing? I mean, we could have had some elaborate tramp, trumpets or something like that, but it really is just a horn of an animal. There is a simplicity to it. It's very antique. It's very ancient. It's very basic. I mean, it's just a horn that's hollowed out and drill a hole, polish off the end, and that's it. It's really that simple. There's no mouth mouthpieces on so far as either. You know, a lot of trumpet players would say, oh, yeah, this, you know, if you have a mouthpiece, you could really get some tunes out of it, but guess what? The kosher shofar, it just has to be straight shofar, just the way it is. Uh, and so now you know the reason why uh, you won't see cow horns sounded. So let me take you to, uh, to the passage here in Leviticus 23. This is the core passage in the Torah. It says, again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel saying, in the seventh month of the first of the month, you shall have a rest. You shall have a Shabbat. A reminder, by blowing of the trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. It's very simple commandments, if you notice it. So what are we supposed to do? It's a Shabbat, it's a rest, and then we're supposed to remember something by the blowing of the trumpets. What we're remembering is, the, is tied to the questions that I have been asking you about. What is the purpose? Now, why the shofar? What is shofar supposed to remind us? Because if I hear a sound, a lot of times I'm reminded of something. 
Have you ever like heard a song play and it took you down a memory lane? I mean, that happens to us all the time. The same thing would happen with a smell. Like if, if I ever smell like matzo ball soup, I'm, I'm, I am in Passover mode immediately. I'm like, I am I'm just traveling down that lane no matter how hard I can try. It's just certain sounds, it, they take us there. And so for Israelites, the shofar was supposed to take them somewhere. Where do you think it should take them? Very good. It's exactly, you see this mountain? I've got a hint here for you right there. See this? Now you probably don't recognize the topography. Most people don't. Uh, this is somewhere here in this general area. And the mountains like that is considered to be the original place of Mount Sinai. Nobody knows for sure. Because it's not like somebody marked a spot with a little flag, like on a golf course. You know, and just like, stood there the whole time, holding a position. Yeah. We just took off his shoes here. Here's the spot. You know, please take off yours. This is the holy ground. Things like that. It's like nobody just put a plaque on there. It was a mountain on the peninsula in that general area. Down the road they traveled out of Egypt, and eventually they would come upon a mountain. And in fact, it's a whole range of mountains right there. And so what... Shofar sound is supposed to remind us, first and foremost, is perhaps it's this story of Exodus. It's the offering of the Torah to the people of Israel. Let's look at this passage just briefly. It says, All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning and the flashes and the sound of the trumpet, shofar. Okay, this is what you hear. And the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you. In order that the fear of him will remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. So this is the Sinai story. And this is what Shofar is actually supposed to remind us about. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Who blew the Shofar on the day the commandments were given? Because I give you a hint. It wasn't Moses. His hands were busy. Remember? <laughs> Who did this? Hashem did it. Hashem, or perhaps one of his angels, or perhaps two or three or five or 75. I really don't know. I wasn't there. But it says that when that happened, there was thunder and lightning and flashes in the sky, and a thick cloud was over the mountain, and the shofar sound came out of that thick cloud. And when that happened, the people trembled. And they fell to the ground. And they said, Moses, would you please talk to God and just relay what it is that he wants to say? Because this is scary. This is an amazing moment in history where not just one person had a vision of Hashem. Not just two people saw or, or Yeshua on the mountain or something like that turning, oh, glowing and something like that. This is not just three or five people seeing something with their eyes. This is the entire nation of Israel. You have hundreds of thousands of people standing at the foot of the mountain, and they all witness the same. The mountain is shaking, it's quaking. The roaring noise that comes out of it, like the sound of the shofar, that's what they hear. It's those trumpets that they hear. And they all are saying, Hashem is in this place, and we are in deep trouble. So what we're supposed to be reminded of when we hear the shofar sound is that moment. And look at what people said. Moshe says, do not be afraid. God has come in order to test you in order to, that you may fear him. The fear of him will remain with you so that you may not sin. A lot of times, the reason why we fall into sin is because the fear of God is not in us. The fear of God is not in us. We forget 
that the purpose of our lives is to please Hashem. We forget the purpose of our lives, the reason why we follow commandments, that the end is good for us. But in the end, it also is a covenant between us and the Holy God, the creator of this entire world, the creator of us. And yes, we should be trembling in fear because he is a mighty and powerful God. And we do answer for these things because we are in a covenant. We are in a kind of relationship where we have obligations. He has made promises and obligations, and we have obligations on our part. So yes, Hashem is coming to test. He says, don't be afraid of this. What you should really be afraid is God. That's, this, is, this is for you to see what it's like to talk to God face to face. So, yes, when we hear the sound of the shofar, we're reminded of the commandments, we're reminded of the Sinai, and we are reminded of our obligation to walk in righteousness before Hashem, and we're reminded that we do stand in answer for our sin. So it does remind us of that. So when we read the verse in uh, Leviticus and Vayikra that says that we should sound, that's what it should stir within our hearts. A lot of people don't understand, you know, but for somebody who has been a part of a synagogue worship for a long time, every time you hear the shofar, these are the images that pop into your mind. These are the connections. This is the memory lane that you start traveling on. So maybe you haven't, you don't have that memory lane yet, because if you're new, those memories have to be made yet. But for Jewish people, these memories go thousands of years back. And it always takes you back to Sinai. Now, what is another place that we already that we always go to when we hear the sound of the shofar? What is another moment in history? What is another pivotal moment in the history of Jewish people? I would say very early on Jericho. that takes us there. What? Jericho. Jericho. Jericho is another one. That's good. Right now, I'm thinking of Abraham and the Akedah. Every morning. We read Akedat Yitzhak. Every morning we go through just a miniature Torah study. At the time of just rising up and saying the first prayers, and we read the Akedat Yitzhak story every time. Why? Because that is the intersection between man and God. This is the ultimate test of faith. And we hope that whatever happens in that day, that we would be like Avraham Avinu, right? That we would follow instead of Avraham, because what he did as many of us would probably struggle with doing. He was asked to do something very, very difficult, and he was willing to go through that. It was an incredible test of faith. And so, to us, Abraham is the example, the ultimate example of obedient faith and trust in Hashem, no matter what. He did not know what was going to happen or not happen with Isaac. He had no idea. All he knew that he had to be obedient to Hashem. This goes back to the idea that some commandments make sense to us and some commandments don't make sense to us. Well, guess what? Go take your son up on the mountain and bring him to me as an offering. It certainly is a commandment that does not make sense. <laughs> but he still did it. So when we go back to the moment of Akidat Yitzhak, what happens? Yitzhak is on the stone about to be offered to God. And yet right there in the bushes is caught a ram. And it is that ram that takes its heart's place upon the altar. That ram gets sacrificed, right? And it is the horn from that ram that sounds on Rosh Hashanah. Reminding us of what now? Think of the Akedat Yitzhak story. What are the lessons tied to the shofar that we can carry out of that one? That God is faithful. That moment connects to everything before and after the emerald thing. It took place or emerald thing takes place of importance. Because, which is why we read it every day. That's right. right. Because it takes us back to creation. When, is a tradition, that's where God formed Adam mm -hmm. and and then placed them in the end of God again. And it's a tradition that, um, it connected to that point, the tradition that obviously what he did, connecting to Sinai and connecting to Mashiach all at the same time. It's like a, 
a complete connection. And the story I could always talk, it has a lot of connections throughout time, as, as Brad is saying, absolutely right. There's the present, the future, the past, they're all connected in that story because the story is very multifaceted and we see kind of the images and the hints. Remember, we're, we're told to read the Torah and not just to always read the Torah and its face value, but to look behind those words, to look behind those meanings and recognize what are some of the hints, what are some of the ideas, right? We talk about reading Sud, right? We talk about reading something that's not apparent, that's not clear, that's kind of hiding behind the proverbial bush caught in a thicket, right? And we're looking for that truth. And it's in there. If we start digging through the Akidat Yitzhak, we could study it forever because there's so many aspects. You want to see Messiah in that story? Of course you will see Messiah in that story. You want to see Sinai in that story? It's right there as well. So yes, uh, God is faithful. That is what we're thinking about when we read the Akidat Yitzhak story. And you know, you know another, the, the lesson for me that I'm always is, is, is that even if I don't understand what Hashem wants from me, I still need to do it. Because that is the proof of my faith. That was a definition. That was a, like a, a movie about faith, if you will, because <clears throat> Abraham knew, and Isaac had, had faith too, because he, he wasn't a little kid like he was. Right. Yes. He was a grown man yeah. at the time. They both knew that God had made a promise. And so it was the faith in that when God was faithful, that no matter how he brought it to be, even if he died, he right. resurrected from them. They knew he had to go on one way or the other because yeah. God said, through Isaac, through I Isaac. established my covenant. Yes. And God made promises. All of those promises were contingent on Abraham having a son, and he knew which son because he told him, take your son, your only son, and take him to the top of the mountain and offer him to me. So he knew this. And so this is... To me, it's a, it's a really moving story, and it is completely tied to the shofar, and it's exactly when we hear the sound of shofar, that's what we're taken back to, to those lessons, to those moments of saying, I, you know, I will be tested sometimes. I'll be asked to do things I don't know, I don't understand. Some commandments in the Torah are going to make no sense to me, but I have to be faithful to do them because Hashem knows what's best, and I can't see the future. I don't know what's, what's what. But I have to trust. I have to have that sort of faith like Abraham had to do the same thing. So, and in the end, it all worked out, right? And so, and I know that in the end, it will work out for us. That's the same lessons we carry away. As we stand before Hashem on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur, what is, what is in our minds? What are we wondering about? We're wondering about of how God will look upon our lives. How will he judge us? What are we looking like to him? And this is the moment of trust. Whatever Hashem sees in us, I'm fine with that. Because I know everything works out in the end for those who have trust in Hashem. So you just fall to His mercy and don't stress out. Because in the end, you are in the hands of a wonderful, just, yet merciful God. So... Akidat Yitzhak is that kind of a story. It touches us on a deep level, and those of us who are parents and who are reading this, we can't help but not put ourselves into that same very situation and wonder if we were ever asked to do something similar, uh, we'd be able to go through it. So yes, great, great uh, story here. So Isaiah 58, cry loudly, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, and declare to my people, their transgressions into the house of Jacob, their sins. The prophets, a lot of times, were told to cry out to God like a trumpet, loudly to declare the sins. When we hear the sound of the shofar, that's what it reminds us of. It reminds us of the condition we stand in. On one hand, we are in the hands of a merciful God, in the Akidat Yitzhak, and we know everything will work out. On the other hand, we're standing before a shaking and trembling mountain covered with smoke, with lightning shooting out of it. And on the other hand, we realize that we need to be called back to Hashem. We need God's servants coming into our life and reminding us of something that we do, uh, that we need to change, that we need to turn around, that we need to repent. So, Shofar declares to us that we have transgressions, we have our sins, and we must return to Hashem. That's what this season is all about. Now, uh, another one was um, 
was mentioned, and we'll get there. Here's, here's a verse from Ezekiel that I want you to think about for a, minute, for a few minutes. Ezekiel 33. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land, and the people of the land take one man from among them and make their watchmen, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be upon his own head. The prophet has recorded a very interesting um, analogy for us. A warning. Alarms exist for a purpose. They tell us to wake up, right? As Al said. That's what Shofar does. Not just if you fall asleep during a service, but for real. Wake up spiritually. Because sometimes our lives are in danger. This passage speaks of an enemy attacking, coming, and the city will fall, but the watchman takes the trumpet and blows the trumpet, and that sound pierces the air, and it warns the people, the enemy is coming, you're about to get overrun, you're going to get hurt, run, flee, hide, do whatever you have to do, take care of yourselves, don't pretend that nothing is happening. So yes, the shofar is a warning. It's an alarm to set us off, to wake us up, to make us realize that spiritually speaking, we've walked into a moment on the calendar where God is looking at us. And if we don't change the pattern in how we act, if we don't sort of say take this moment to account for what is happening and what has happened in this past year, we may be going down a dangerous path. Ignoring warnings. We have lots of warnings that come to us in different ways in life, right? But ignoring warnings, sometimes we get away with it. But sometimes it, it costs us. We pay the price. Some warnings we simply cannot ignore. Now, this warning has to do with our spiritual lives. Because the purpose of hearing shofar is not to physically wake up. The purpose of hearing shofar is to wake up spiritually if we are asleep. Now, some of us are wide awake, and others maybe have fallen back into slumber. I don't know. Nobody knows. In fact, the only person who does know is Hashem himself. But we need it. We need to hear it. Our soul needs to hear it in order to wake up and realize that the moment that we are approaching is a potentially dangerous moment for us. Nobody is guaranteed tomorrow. There's all the business that you wanted to get done. The important business with Hashem is done. I mean, I know you're, you know, you probably have some dishes sitting around and, you know, some other things that you, your yard maybe not as raked. And are, I'm sure there are things in your household that are undone and they will always be undone. But is your spiritual business with Hashem, are you in the right place? Are you ready? If that is the day, essentially. So the shofar sounds to give you a warning that, Check yourself. Are you ready to go to have that moment? So, warnings should not be ignored. And then when we're talking about, you know, if the harm comes and takes him away, his blood will be upon his head. Meaning the, per- the person who does ignore the warning of the shofar blower, he has nobody else to blame because he has been warned. And so we sound the shofar, to awaken people to that moment of repentance, not because everyone in our midst needs to repent. I guess we do, but, but the point is that it's a warning for all of us on whatever level that we do need it. So here's what we talked about earlier, Joshua. Another reason the shofar sounds, another purpose, another sort of say admonition that we can take out of the many lists of whys the shofar sounds is perhaps this passage, Joshua chapter 6. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, or the shofars, the text says. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, 
and the wall fell down flat. So the people went up into the city, and every man straight ahead, and they took the city. So that's straight out of uh, Joshua. What is this about? What is so significant about the Battle of Jericho and the shofar sounded besides the historical footnote? What's the point? You know, how is this tied to our spiritual lives? Is what I'm saying, basically. Trusting God with his instructions. Like, uh... mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, this is another one of those commandments that makes absolutely no sense, right? March around the city and blow the horn. How is that going to help us anything? Lord, how about you give us a plan for a weapon? Yeah. How about, you know, in 13th century before, you know, common era, you give me a plan for a cannon and I take down these walls? <laughs> because, you know, God could have taught them how to make a cannon. You know, all you need is a little construction, some gunpowder. They would have been very advanced militarily immediately. But that's not what happens. God tells them, march around the city, blow the shofar. Makes no sense. But that's an example. A commandment we don't fully understand, but we're supposed to be obedient. We're supposed to do that. What's another spiritual side that we're possibly going on? What, what, what are some of the lessons? Uh, Paul writes about casting and reading no air or artillery support, but God said we trust Him mm-hmm. to carry out what He says. And if it's something we have a difficult time understanding, I go back to when I was a little guy or when my, my children were little. They didn't understand because I'm the daddy. That's why. Okay. What is a strong call, by the way? How, how are we to under, even understand that when Paul talks about these things? I'm, I'm always wondering what, what he meant by that. I like impregnable fortress and inescapable. Okay. okay. Jericho was an impregnable fortress. Weren't the walls like 12 or 15 feet thick? Yeah, they were, they were, yeah, walls. yeah. You so could it was drive a chariot. You could drive a chariot in, in, in the walls. Crowd loud. The stronghold is in our brain. So when we Amen. instead of just praying silently, but to cry out with our own voice as a trumpet against yes. the stronghold, acknowledging it, and yes. coming against it, then we can break it down in our own. Yes, way. yes, yes. Thank you, Anthony. The stronghold is in us, ladies and gentlemen. We need the sound of the shofar to break down the walls that we have erected around our hearts. And guess what are we keeping out? Hashem and His Word. That's what we're keeping out. We're keeping out people. We're keeping out His Ruach. We are keeping out because whatever we built on the inside, we like for it to stay that way. And when it comes to Hashem, we need to surrender. Those strongholds do need to be brought down. It's true. It's very difficult for us sometimes as human beings to open those gates. <laughs> it seems like that's the same thing that a seed has to undertake in order to grow, has to die, has to... That's true. Completely break through the soil. Good analogy. Break through the soil, that's right. Speaking of soil and also tying back to power structure, you know, Isaiah 40 talks about, it says, Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. There is the small grain of sand, like on a scale. Like right. dust on a scale. Dust on a scale. They are nothing, and it says they are nothing to God. Mm-hmm. They, they are nothing. So basically, you know, over the past few years, we've seen like globalism take shape with like the World Economic Forum, and you could look back 70 years, you could look back at World War II, you could even look at the Cold War. Power structures at play in this world, if you look behind that, the Almighty God is, is far beyond any of those, mm-hmm. those yes. power plays. Amen. I think World Economic Forum should adopt a new logo, and it should be shaped in a Tower of Babel. <laughs> exactly. Just, to, just, to, just for those of us who know the story, to sit yeah. back and laugh and, and re- recognize that you know, Hashem is in charge, and that's and it's all going to come down, and He's going to confuse the languages, and things like that will happen. I forget which agency it is. There is some global group that did build a building that looks like this Tower of Babel. Or at least they're, they're I'm sure that people have tried to do it, except nobody knows what the Tower of Babel looks like. Yeah. But there is a building out there. <laughs> <laughs> Unless people are looking at medieval art, you know, and things like that, which is <coughs> our, our perceptions on the Tower of Babel are actually shaped by European medieval art. You know that? Because they're the people who 
drew it first. You know, it's not like Jews said, all right, let's draw the Tower of Babel to illustrate our Bible. No, it was the medieval Christians who started doing that. And so now it's forever etched in our mind of what it looks like. And if you've seen those paintings, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's going to be round, and it's going to be circular, and it's going to have little ter terraces, little things like that, you know. You got it! It's like the Tower of Pisa, only a little bit more conical, right? You have it. So you, could, what do you want to bet that, that that artist was inspired by that? So yet, today, everybody thinks that that's what the Tower of Babel really looks like. Uh, our, our minds have been forever polluted by art, you know. That's, we, we, cannot, we cannot escape it. We are. It's okay. We're visual creatures. You show us a picture, we remember it, and, and that's what we think it is. But we have to, you know, clean that. You know, if I think about it, the, the, it probably looked probably more like a ziggurat or something like that. It would make no sense for them to build something circular. It'd be more squarish. <laughs> with really long stairs leading up. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, that seems to be the, the mode of architecture those people back in those days were capable of. Okay, But back to the story of Joshua. Breaking down the walls. What, how is the shofar supposed to speak to us? The sound of the shofar, not level. How is the story of Jericho connecting with the shofar, connecting with us today, Rosh Hashanah, Day of Atonement, all these things going through our mind. What are some of the spiritual lessons that might pop up? So, my studies leading up here, Hashem has really helped me this year to have a different approach. I beg for something not to be ritually boredom. Uh, and He just opened my eyes through our book that we're reading in the men's group that Rosh Hashanah is a reminder. Well, the original was a ketubah. Mm -hmm. It's our marriage. Yes. We come back every year. It's in Shaun so far that the king is before us and that we're married to him. It's a reminder of our commitment of the mm -hmm. ketubah. So most of the ketubah is really written from a man's point of view, point of view to a woman, his bride. Mm -hmm. So in that is his commitment to us. And did we fail? to keep our commitment to him by trusting that he would do those things for us. So the sounding of shofar and the passage you had in Ezekiel mm -hmm. is that reminder of our commitment and did we fail in our trust in him. Uh, we're coming back to our, our, our marriage day, you know, and uh, did we fail to keep our commitment? And then Yom Kippur is the time where we can Re renew, in a sense, or, or get uh, forgiveness, but it's a way of Hashem saying, no, I'm wrapping my arms around you, and we get to Sukkot, we're back in the honeymoon stage, and we're back intimately <coughs> with Hashem, celebrating, you know, the world to come, but, you know, it, we can look that far down, but just right here, our renewed presence of our covenant. Uh, you know, Christ, we could use the Christian statement of salvation, the day of salvation when I came to know the Lord, but really it's our commitment, regardless of where you came from in your spiritual walk, to Hashem. And that is the ketubah of marriage. And each year we're reminded of our commitment to that. Also, His commitment to us. And so where we failed it, we get to young people, we get to confess our sins, but Hashem is just like putting his arms around and saying, I still love you. I'm still married to you. I'm not divorced. I didn't leave. Right. And then enter into the, the, the chamber. Of, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. A lot of people do not see the uh, Sinai covenant as a ketubah, but it is like a ketubah. It is a contract. It is a covenant. It is a, a relationship that describes our obligations towards each other. And we're called to renew that commitment over and over. So the passages that we read in the Torah right now is, you know, is Israel is standing on a threshold and God is renewing their covenant with them. And guess what? When they cross over to the other side, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to get circumcised. People were not circumcised in the middle of Israel this year. They're going to get circumcised and they're going to offer sacrifices and renew that commitment again. And so on and so forth with, with uh, just book of Joshua. And yes, it is that moment of renewing of commitment. The, the imagery of the bride and groom is a beautiful one. It's used all throughout the prophets and all throughout the Bible. And I'll remind you something. In the ancient days, as the bride approached the town, where, uh, as, as the bridegroom approached the town of the bride's family, 
guess what sound they will hear. The shofar. They would, they would sound the shofar to let them know. Alarm, we're coming. <laughs> we're getting closer. Get the party ready. And then we're going to take the bride away back to our house. And that's where the real party begins. But, you know, we're coming and there's that big, long procession. So the sound of the shofar. Yes, you have a question. I don't have any scriptural basis for this, but the first thing that came to my mind when you started talking about this was, you said, why do we need to hear it? Yes. And I, I just crossed my mind, and, and then you, you talked about different script text, uh, so that we can hear it, because maybe not everybody will hear it. Right. You know, like you said, they they weren't um, the, the, the prophet where he's warning them. If you don't hear this, and you don't take heed, you don't do right. something, yeah. you're in trouble. So it just, my mindset was, maybe not everybody's going to hear it. Yes, when, when, And so true. the fact that you can hear it, that you're used to hearing it, or that you're in tune with it, then all that stuff that it represents can mean something to you. But if you're out of it, if you're separate from it, and you're never hearing it, then you're not going to hear it. I don't know what that means, but that's just what... Okay, that's what came. That's good. Let's keep chewing on it. Sometimes Hashem gives us these little tidbits as we think about it. And we're not meant to just kind of let it go. We're actually supposed to digest it and think about it because there is something in it for us a lot of times personally. So, um, Joshua, as I think about it, I'm also thinking of the sound of the victory right now and strength. Because our Hashem is a strong and powerful God that the sound of this trumpet can bring down the most impregnable forces so these walls are coming down. And that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, my thought kind of went to Rahab okay. and the mixed multitude at Mount yes. Sinai and the Gentiles. Yes. And we are to grab the seat seat of the Jewish people. So her faithfulness as a Gentile to uphold the Jewish people God's chosen, I kind of went through that. Beautiful story. In every generation, and this is very important to us because this is a prophet, we're a prophetic community. We believe that God is doing something amazing, restoring, restoring something and preparing uh, for, for that Olam Haba, right? Beautiful story. There are always people in every tribe and every nation that will see Hashem as, as, as godless as they may be at that moment. But when they see the faith of Israel, when they see what God is doing, they will join themselves to the people of Israel and say, we want to be with you because we see what your God is doing. We want to be a part of this. And so to us, this is, this is very much the same. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And even the mixed multitude at Sinai, you realize that at the Sinai, uh, Israelites were not the only people standing because a whole lot of people came out of Egypt kind of under the sound and noise of all the things that were happening. There were people saying, oh, we can leave. All right, I'm coming with you too. <laughs> Your God is taking you out. I am joining him. Uh, or they're in the back, Matt. Yeah, I thought that heard me explanation with Rahab was not just that the kingdom was coming, namely like the kingdom of Israel is coming this time, but also that the king was coming because Rahab is incorporated in the line of the side comes through her <laughs> as well. And so like, there just seems to be like, remember because of not just today's salvation, but remember because of the future salvations that are in store, the unpacking of future millennials, of, of mm -hmm. um, the future kingdom expansion. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, this, it's a, it's a multi-layered story. Yes, Josh. <laughs> that when Torah was given out to Sinai that all the suddenly languages were... Mm. It was given that they all heard it in their language. Yes. So why would, why would that happen? The Midrash, the Midrash tell, tells us why it happens. Because all the people standing at the foot of Mount Sinai needed to hear it and understand the offer. The offer was give, being given, you know, and they needed to hear and to understand it. And uh, apparently Israelites said, we'll take it. <laughs> uh, the, the beauty of that Rahab thing is, is that... Jericho knew that Israel was across, was across. So they knew of, they heard. Right. And those who grabbed the hold of the sea secret got out. And then judgment upon the nations of the stronghold that was there in the mine was destroyed or was judged. And the beauty of that for the nations, it says, I think, in Isaiah 58, is that identity and everything that they have to connect to Israel shall be given such a great honor um, that are making that ultimate step of saying your people will be my people and that means saying my people will no longer be my people 
So that's the part that people forget about. It's not just saying your people will be my people and I will add you to a list of things I like to do. It's meaning my people, the people that I've had all along, they're not anymore. I'm leaving that reservation. I'm moving. That's it. That's a big step. So yes, a great name and a great honor has been attached to somebody who does that. There's a verse that says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and those who are righteous run into it and are saved. And her home became a tower, yes. and everything else fell down except right. her right. Else around it. Up. And she entrusted in the name of, of mm -hmm. Hashem. It's a beautiful story of redemption. It's a beautiful story of redemption, right. because right. remember who she was by trade, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful story of redemption. If anybody ever needed grace in their life, and if everybody ever thought that whatever they have to offer to Hashem is not good enough, uh, people like that um, are prime examples of what Hashem does with a person who returns, with a person who comes to Him. You know, it's it's amazing. So, story of Joshua and 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 the, and the tower falling down. And I know I got the wrong city over there. I got a I got a little Greek Greek columns going on. Here. <laughs> but nobody noticed, <laughs> unless you're an architecture buff or something. Like that. Wrong period. But you know what? As Matt was saying, is uh, it, it, it's this is a cyclical story. It's a multi-layer story. There are salvations upon salvations, and guess what? There are many Jerichos that need to fall down. Some of them are still standing, and they probably need to be brought down at some point, and some of them will be brought down in our lifetime. 